asked to uh, come up with some titles, I came up with this title. And later I began thinking about it, wondering how I was possibly going to deal with it. There are many ways in which you can deal with it. I'd like to point out something, though, you see. Um, we talked about the present, Platonic philosophy, and we're talking about the future. And to talk about the future of Platonic philosophy is really to talk about uh, how the past lays the foundation for the future. Now, let me start from the beginning and be a little bit heretical, because that's much easier and more direct. There is no there is no Platonic philosophy. That's the biggest problem. There is no Platonic philosophy. If philosophy is the love of wisdom, And if we understand that platonically, what that really means is how the mind is, is or how the mind functions in the pursuit of the love of wisdom. Now, it's mind only, the symposium that reaches the insight into the nature of ultimate reality. That's the way it's described. Now, therefore, if the mind functions for a vision, that's what it's doing, the mind functions for vision, then the mind is an intellectual instrument that's capable of seeing into the nature of ultimate reality, which is what wisdom is. And the experience of wisdom, as we all know, that is experienced as the perfection of beauty. An overwhelming experience of which nothing greater can be possibly conceived. But it's through the mind only that that experience is reached. Second part, when it's experienced, the experiencer recognizes of necessity that that experience is capable of being infinitely expanded that one can enter into it. Right, can enter into it more and more profoundly, no end. Now, notice the words enter into it. That means the mind then is capable of participating in that beauty. Now, the word participation sometimes is a difficult word to play with because it really means can, can experience it, possess it, enter into it, find itself within it, all of those words. So don't take it as a part, taking a part, the action that takes part of a part. That, that's not it at all. No parts. Now, going back now, look here. If this is a universal experience acknowledged by different systems, that man can therefore enter into more profoundly this great experience of pure beauty, which in the Platonic world is called entering into the uh, 
pure light of being or the divine radiance. All systems that have this idea, Tibetan, Buddhism, uh, Buddha, various systems of Buddhism, the Hindus, yoga sutras, etc., have this participation in light. Therefore, what makes this Platonic is simply that the mind, the mind is functioning for this end and no other tool, no other way is being employed. Therefore, if you're going to use the mind to try to reach that kind of a state, you are going to recover step by step the Platonic tradition because that's what it is. Therefore, we don't even need the word Platonic. It is a natural way of reasoning if that's your goal. If you, wanted to, if you decide to reach that pure light of being, the divine radiance with mind alone, one way or the other you're going to develop what is called a Platonic system. Therefore, there is no such thing as a Platonic system. It's a natural system when you are primarily concerned with gaining a vision of the nature of reality with and through the mind. You don't need the word platonic because you're going to do it platonically. So, now, this is a curious statement to make. There is no platonic philosophy because anyone who does philosophy using the mind is going to do it, as it were, platonically. You don't even need the texts. Matter of fact, in the ancient world, they thought that you could do away with all the Platonic texts and all you needed was a few quotes from the Chaldean, Chaldean oracles and that's all you needed to reconstruct the entire system. So therefore, what I'd like to do tonight is to try to take you to what I think this is going, where this, this idea is going. And I'm going to pull it out of my own past and to try to therefore take you through a guided tour. First, all right, first. Let's see if we can see these words, mind and function, because I'm going to use them in a very interesting and strict way. All right, here we go. Now, in the description of tonight's talk, the first word is dialectic. So let me take you through a guided tour. All right, now look at What is dialectic? Dialectic is an ordered way to explore a problem step by step so you can take anyone else through it so they can give the consent of their mind to each step. Now, basically man is confronted with only one basic problem, right? How to direct his life? How do you direct that life? That's the, that's the, that's the primary problem. How do you direct your life? Now, To direct something means you have a goal and you have some way of reaching it. Now, you can, you can use many ways, there are many approaches, many ways that go in a variety of directions. And therefore, I'd like to introduce the idea of function in a different way. Right? So let's separate ourselves from this and return to it for a moment, in a moment. Right? If I say that um, this chalk has a function, what I mean by that is to say that it alone can do what it does best. It's designed for that purpose, and among all things, this does it best. If that's what it does it best, then that's its particular function. See, that's its function. If that's its function, then it's likely that this was made for that particular purpose. That's what I mean by purpose. That's what I mean, therefore, by function. All right, what is it? If something alone can do something, that alone can do it, and it does it best, then that's its function. Now, necessarily, we're highlighting the word best. Eyes. All right, the eyes. Would you not agree the eyes see? <laughs> Nothing else can see other than the eye. It alone can do it. Nothing else can do it. You can't get the ears to see. Therefore, we can say 
the primary function of the eyes is to see, since it alone can do it, and so far as we know, do, since it <laughs> alone can do it, it is its primary function. It's designed or made for that purpose. Now, since there are many things that can do something, now, let's take the classic example. If I want to cut some vines, I can use a chisel, I can rip it apart with my hands, I can use a saw, I can do many things. Many things can function for that purpose, but not the way we're using it, because when we're saying function, we mean that some, if only it alone can do it and does it best. That's what we mean by function. Therefore, let me take a turn around and say, would you not agree of the many things that might be able to sever a vine, the pruning knife can do it best because it's designed for that purpose. That's its function. Since it can do it best, it's designed for that particular purpose. Therefore, everything that functions this way has a particular excellence. Excellence. Eh? It has an excellence. It can achieve it. So if it has a function, it has its own particular excellence. Equally well, would you agree? Now, the excellence of a pruning knife is only effective to the degree which it's sharpened properly. If it gets dull, rusty, and things of that nature, then it can't function without excellence, and therefore there's a natural defect or vice for every excellence. Because when it doesn't function with its excellence, but functions with its cor corresponding defect, then it does whatever it does badly, then that's its vice. So now let's take a look at three ideas. We do not agree that to get here tonight, to get here tonight, you had to again, you had to consider getting here. You had to have a plan. You had to command yourself to do it. And you only decided to get here because you thought it would benefit you in some way. Now, these three things, planned, command, care, is in man. Something in, our, something in, in the very nature of man, we plan, variety of plans. Uh, we're willing to command ourselves to take on one of those plans only if we think it's really going to do us some good. That is to say, we care for ourselves, we benefit. Now, take another one. There are means, therefore, there's something in man that does that. What shall we say does that? In the Greek world, that's called soul or psyche. Then it alone, hey, if the psyche alone can plan, care, command, then that its particular function, that's what it does best, that's its excellence. Take the next part. What is, this, what is it in us that pays attention to particular things? Seeks to control so that we can achieve that goal of paying attention and deliberating. Again, would you not agree? Those are the particular characteristics of the mind and when it does its job and functions ideally, then a particular excellence of the mind emerges. Oh. If the particular excellence of the mind functions, then it allows us to decide on some direction. But now look here, what direction? What direction? How do you decide the direction? It's easy for particular things, it's easy in business, it's easy on vacations, planning all kinds of things. But how do you determine one's highest Venture, highest ideal. Then when you're after this, then you're into something quite important to yourself and to everything you engage in. Why? Because how do you know you can do it? What's the way to get it? Can you really do it? Now, if one's highest ideal is to gain a glimpse or an insight into the nature of ultimate reality. And to the degree that you devote yourself to that goal and decide then that it's important to do that as purely as possible, 
therefore you're going to function with the mind. Ah, then you're going to, then you're going to care, you're going to plan, you're going to command what's best for you. You're going to believe, do you not, that this is going to benefit you, that's going to be the assumption that's going to benefit you. Well, you don't know it's going to benefit you. The whole thing may be folly. The whole thing may be foolish to engage in such an effort. So what are the ways in which we can deal with this? Now, let me go over one. Every dialectic is a one-many problem. Every dialectic is a one-many problem. You can ask what's the nature of an automobile and you can break it down into the different kinds of automobiles. You can talk about soap, what's the nature of soap, you can break it up into different kinds of soaps. So in the same way, if you're going to pursue this goal of gaining an insight into ultimate reality, I suspect there are only four ways you can go, and maybe a four and a half. You can use some substance, alcohol, drugs, coffee, I don't know, any number of drugs, LSD, whatever it might be. You can use some method. Uh, you can be the recipient of grace, or it can be you and you alone. And there's another category, dreams. And you notice I put it into two places. I put it into the realm of grace as well as you and you alone. So it's a curious. In my own mind, um, I think it's a separate category. Even though it's you dreaming. And it's also a, a, a thou, you see, because after all, you can't determine what dream you're going to get. So in that respect, it's a kind of grace. So therefore, I'll call that four and possibly a fifth. Yeah, yeah. If, if it's possible, if it's possible, you see, for a person spontaneously to have the experience, yeah, okay. no cause, no sense of the divine as an agent, being the recipient, then I can't use the idea of grace or thou. Oh, I see, okay. right. Now, um, is, now look here. Are these good categories? These good categories. Now wait, I'll tell you why. Um, well, grace, sometimes yeah. people think of as uh, something happens spontaneous. That's true. We call that grace. That's true. Terminology. But you have to then be willing to say that there must be some cause of the, of the experience when you assign grace to it that you've been given a granted a gift, a dispensation, or something like that. That has to be in some degree in the experience. Or you're interpreting the experience through grace. Mm -hmm. So you're raising the point that maybe we only have three or four categories, and maybe we can combine three and four. But no, no, yeah. no, no, no. Now, the reason I wanted to bring this up and look at it is because uh, I have had dreams, enlightenment dreams, that were later s passed through the game of uh, getting authenticated and, and, and uh, verified or confirmed by roshis and yogis years and years ago when I was a young man. So therefore, I would say then there is good evidence in my own experience that this is a way. Now, what's interesting about it is that um, I also was able to bring back that state of mind independent of dreams. And yet there was no sense of a thou without any method at all. And therefore, I hit this. 
Um, then, uh, this is in uh, July, first experiment, July 22nd, 1955. Uh, then, uh, this is very disturbing to have that kind of experience, you know, because you really, see, how do you know it's real? It comes to the dream. There's all kinds of people, when I mentioned in those days, uh, were arguing it's impossible to have one through dreams. And all authorities were, at that point in my experience, were taking positions in respect to that. And so I decided the right way to do it is not to describe how I got it or in what circumstance, just talk about the experience. Talk about the experience and there was any doubt about what it was in the minds of people who are competent to judge these sorts of things. But then, when I also had the same experience independent of dreams, then I could again go to the same kinds of people I was working with and they could then confirm both. The interesting thing about it now for this talk is that it was of the same kind of experience, that is, the uh, pure luminosity. Then, uh, a friend of mine and teacher, who's, who will at this point be nameless, uh, <clears throat> gave me some LSD. And lo and behold, I had the same experience again with LSD. And again, I could talk about it and, and in any one of these categories. And I must say that that experience, um, in terms of time and, and uh, psychic space, was, was allowed the idea that this can be penetrated to greater and greater degrees of profundity. It gave me the evidence that that's the case. There was no doubt about it. Then. I got involved in, because of this, because of this, naturally I got involved in all kinds of yoga, meditation. And uh, I think that's essential, that people who get into this and reach some kind of profound experience don't stay there. They don't become dependent upon it that they then try to reach the same thing without it because you always know when you're in that experience to the degree that you reflect, you're aware of the fact that there was something about that experience you brought with you and therefore there's always the, the, the sense that that was a catalyst. We're aware of that's a catalyst. It didn't produce it, it was a catalyst. Well, I'm not an expert on Timothy Leary from what I've heard. He yeah. continued taking the LSD. Well, that's right. It. Yeah, okay. I would say that there are people who do that. And uh, um, I would say the people I know, uh, many people I know, have left it because they are much, much more interested in discovering what it's like directly. Ram Dass. <laughs> yeah, Ram Dass was one of them, yeah. Now, this is the curious problem now, grace. What is that term? I mean, it, it, because in one way you could say grace is acting in meditation, it's acting in yoga, it acts through substances, it's a catalyst. You could take that one term and blanket the entire group. There's no reason why it can't, it doesn't. It all depends upon what you're going to say constitutes this rather curious word. Because wherever you put the boundary on this, you necessarily have a greater boundary for grace. To the degree that this distinction loses its significance, so too does the idea of you lose its significance. And so too you get a different look at the idea of grace. So these are correlative terms. They, they function in different ways. Now, I'd like to continue this because there's another side to it. All right, ready? Here we go. Um, in order to explore this, I really can't separate it from myself because I played uh, my 
game did not emerge through books, and I don't quote books to make the points I make. Luckily, <coughs> fate had behind it that I was able to be open to these kinds of experiences over the years. So therefore, I would like to then take you to the next stage in order to pursue the idea, what may be the future of this game? And I call it the noblest game. Philosophy to me is the noblest game. Philosophical midwifery. I mean by philosophical midwifery, that art where, let's use the example, when a woman is skilled enough to see another pregnant and can identify that, right, and can assist in the delivery, can make the judgment about whether the birth is a true and noble birth, whether it then is also, on, the, on the, another level, is also capable of functioning as a matchmaker. When all of these things are brought together in the old picture, that person then deserves the title a midwife. Socrates calls himself, as you know, a philosophical midwife because he says, I have the same art as my mother. His mother was a midwife. He says, the only, the only difference is, he said, when I consider men, mankind, he said, I can see whether or not they are pregnant because man can be pregnant in his soul and he needs to give birth. And he said, oh, he said, my art is the same as my mother's. He said, I can tell who's pregnant, who's ready for delivery, or whether or not abortion is necessary. He said, I can therefore help and assist in the delivery and help the pains and the travails that take place during the delivery. I can also judge whether it's a true and noble birth. He said, I'm also a good matchmaker, though I don't want to mention it, he says, because that means he has the ability to send students or people to various teachers. That's matchmaking on the philosoph philosophical level. So that's the way I am going to use the idea of philosophical midwifery, right? Now, we are all, we are all pregnant. Mankind, we are all pregnant. We are all pregnant. And what we are waiting to give birth to is the very experience of ourselves being pregnant. Man is both right, two-sided. There's the mortal and the immortal side. He's really going around looking to, to give birth to ultimate reality, to a vision of ultimate reality, which is the same thing as himself, the nature of the higher self. And uh, I had a very curious background, which I'd like to share with you for a while. All right. When you have this quest for personal meaning, right, and with this background of various experiences, which I didn't share uh, widely, only very selectively, a colleague, the colleague, a friend of mine who uh, wrote an interesting book in my own way, Alan Watts, describes me as a jnana yogi. He says, Pierre, he says, you are a jnana yoga. Someone who reaches realization with the mind alone. And he called me, therefore, a true jnana yoga whose enlightenment comes through the mind. And I went around saying to myself, well, I don't know whether that's really true. I mean, just because I had those experiences, am I or am I not a jnana yoga? So, that caused me to go into even further into these kinds of studies and uh, studied Buddhism and Hinduism and many of these other subjects with this question, well, you know, is Alan right? Is, 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 is jokes a lot. And let me share something, a kind of fun story. <clears throat> uh, years ago, Alan came up to me and he, when I was, uh, I was uh, teaching, he gave me a fellowship uh, where we were uh, going to school. I was going to the American Academy of Asian Studies. Alan Watts was there. And he called me one day. He said, Pierre, I'm going to give you a lectureship in comparative philosophy. I said, gee, yeah, good, good. And a short while later, he came up to me and he said, Pierre, he said, I'm going to feature you on my radio show. He was doing KPFK, K, KPFA in San Francisco. He said, you might want to listen to it. Well, when I finally did hear the program, which took several weeks of, because he couldn't determine when it was on, they had it on tape. He never once mentioned my name. He described me, described everything I did, 
Never mentioned my name. So later, when he wrote his book, he came up and he said, Pierre, don't worry about it. I put your name in it this time. So what did that do? That drove me to try to figure out, is he right or is he not? Now, he jokes all the time. So do I. So, you know, was he joking? Was he not joking? So I uh, made the rounds with Yasutani Roshi and Kori Roshi and Maizumi Roshi and something curious happened. I knew a group of people and I was working with them and they were close to these enlightenment states only they were blocked. They were blocked. They were blocked. And so when we were at these sessions and the Buddhist sessions we'd take walks around the block and they'd say, hey, I think I'm stuck, and I'd talk to them and bring about a breakthrough in their problem. I did not help them gain enlightenment. I helped them break through what was blocking them. So Yasutani used to say, and as he said later during these sessions, there are two Roshis going on here. There's a second Roshi at these sessions. And I said, I'm not a Roshi. I just happen to know some good questions on how to break people free from their problems. That's all. So I said, wait a minute, is he right? I mean, is he doing the same thing that Alan was doing? Am I or am I not in this curious game where I can say that uh, I'm a teacher? I said, no, nah, I'm no teacher. No, no, no. So then came... <coughs> There's something wrong here. I better examine myself. So I began challenging what I call the unquestioned. You have to figure out what it is you can't question to understand yourself. I mean, because a belief is of such a nature that you think it's true, therefore you don't recognize it as a belief. I mean, a belief is something you think is true. It's a false belief. A false belief that you think is true. So therefore I went around saying to myself, I wonder if I can find a Roshi who can really put this just, you know, she can say no, yes, no. I said, no, I don't want that at all. I want to see whether or not independent of them, whether or not I am a teacher. So I went around, yes, you are to some of them, no, you're not. And the game went on and on. Well, uh, Muktananda dealt went with Muktananda as well. And he was into philosophy. He was into a very similar kind of spandakritikas, which is very similar to the Parmenides' third hypothesis. And that was kin. That was real fine. I went in with that, and we explored the dialectic. By heavens, uh, I, I was thinking of joining them. He died, though, thank goodness, uh, because it saved me the decision whether I wanted to go any further with him. I was very fortunate to save my whole, <laughs> whole issue. And therefore I could escape with, therefore, still not being a teacher. So, uh, one night though, he, he did uh, put a crown of flowers on, on, on me. And uh, I said, nice flowers. I gave them to someone else. It upset someone. But, so next, what do you do now? I'm still pushing it. So, so the only thing out of this, the only way out of this, is to develop this curious art called meditation. Go to the root of existence, forget all of these questions. Now look here. Again, a whole bunch of interesting states of mind emerged. But I still have the perplexing problem. And the perplexing problem, I want to tell you, is very simple. How can I be a teacher? I don't think I have anything to teach. That's all. How can you be a teacher when I don't have anything to teach? And I know I don't have anything to teach. Uh, I can share a few things, but I don't have anything to teach. So therefore, a whole bunch of interesting states of mind emerged. But I'm still left with the curious problem that if I am a teacher, it's, you know, it's it, that beautiful Buddhist saying, it's, you know, you're really doing nothing other than selling water by the river. You know, no one needs it. They already have it. 
you're trying to sell something that no one wants, but yet everybody needs, that's available all over. Maybe you can put it in a good bottle and they'll buy it. <laughs> so, uh, there was an, another Roshi very important to me, uh, Nyo Bang, uh, who came up and said, you're playing a game. He said, and I said, oh, I probably am. He said, yeah, he said, you don't, you don't want to be a teacher, but you are a teacher. I said, no, I'm not a teacher. He said, oh, yes, you are. He said, I'll make a deal with you. He said, I'll translate the Diamond Sutra every Wednesday night and give you a copy, chapter by chapter, but you can't look at it more than two or three minutes before you get up and talk about the Diamond Sutra. He said, you'll see that by doing this, that you'll be able to penetrate it and discuss it and make it clear to, the, to an audience, and therefore you are a teacher. I said, ah. He said, yeah, don't give me ah, do it. So I took the challenge and I did it. And at the end of it, he said, yeah, yeah, there it is. So I said, well, wait a minute. That still doesn't make any sense because just because I'm clever enough to read the Diamond Sutra to his satisfaction and other satisfaction doesn't mean I'm a teacher. It just means I know how to read. That's all. So, uh, I went further. All right? And uh, <coughs> what's curious, I uh, don't want to do it yet, is the problem of the egg. Let me give you the problem of the egg. I'm an egg, see? And uh, needs to be hatched. Right, needs to be hatched. Now, I am convinced that there's some eggs that'll never hatch. They're stone ones. They're really marvelous to look at, aren't they? You ever see those stone eggs? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I finally solved the problem. I think I have. <clears throat> um, there are people, I think, who uh, have nothing to teach, and some people may think that's interesting enough to learn, but then they already know what they're going to get, and they don't have to learn anything other than what they already know. And so therefore, I'm not going to be too successful being a teacher, but at least I'm the kind of a teacher that I am. Now, that sounds rather paradoxical, but that's what I am. So. What do I do with it now when I look at all this stuff and look into the future? That's what I think is going to happen. I think our society is going to bring together a multimedia virtual reality allegory of the cave and the upper world, the Plato's. I think that's what our culture is going to do. They're going to design the allegory of the cave. Now, the allegory of the cave, as you all know, let me quickly give you what I think it's going to be. The prisoners are here since childhood, not birth, childhood. Chained, so all they can do is see the wall on which the shadows are cast. Behind them, on a wall, raised parapet, right, are men who are walking with objects on their head. They can't, therefore, be seen. Behind them is a fire. And that fire, therefore, casts light upon these images, and the reflections, therefore, become the shadows on the wall of the cave. Now, two things are important here. One is their necks are chained in such a way they can't turn around to see one another, and therefore they never know the nature of one another or the nature of man. All they do is look forward, and therefore that light also casts images of themselves on the wall. So there are two things here. One is these objects on their heads, and the next is the shadows of themselves on the wall of the cave, which they take therefore to be reality. Now, in the, in the Republic, Socrates goes to great length to point out that man's basic problem are the beliefs that he has been taught as a child. 
about the nature of reality, about the nature of themselves, and about the nature of society. Three beliefs, self, reality, right, and the world about them. Now, in this multimedia dimension, therefore, I think what's going to happen is that people will be able to, in a short while, be able to, with diagnostic tools, be able to identify the fundamental beliefs that people have that block them in their own psychic development. I think there are tools that are going to be available. I think a good number of them exist already. And therefore, there's going to be a multimedia presentation where people are going to be first screened, tested, and therefore they're going to experience the cave, the underworld cave, and they are therefore going to be, as it were, in a prison, being able, therefore, to stand up, turn around, just as in the allegory of the cave, forced to see, forced to see these beliefs, which are the very sources of their imprisonment, and therefore, this whole thing, therefore, they're going to be taken as if it were real, virtual reality. I suspect what will put them in a very open and suggestible plane might be some kind of psychotropic drug, LSD, or some variation of that. That's going to make them live and see the whole psychic drama, the whole psychic drama, because the next part of the drama is man then must be then see the nature of the condition of his own ignorance and then work his way up the steep ascent and see the upper world. Therefore, we're going to get people who are so skilled in multimedia and virtual reality that are going to be able to present in some form what comes close to a whole range of mystical experiences and they're going to then bring people into it such that they're going to get a taste of it. Not the reality, they're going to get a taste of it. They'll see that it's a doorway. It's a doorway. And all they're going to be doing is passing through a doorway. It's not the home. It's not their house. But they're going to recognize that there is a door. And that drugs, therefore, for our culture, is going to let people know that that door exists and a house behind it is theirs. Therefore, I think what's going to happen is going to be then as people begin to see the possibility of this kind of experience and this kind of use of the mind for the higher purposes, that it's going to open up, therefore, the real possibility of a whole new age of enlightenment under one possibility. That's all, all mankind needs. One has to see it's possible. One has to see that in one of the ways that we mentioned before, one, two, three, or four, and if lucky, five, that man, therefore, can grow psychically and spiritually and come to grips with the very nature of their mind. Now, I think this is where we're going. I don't think there's any way to avoid it. Um, I don't know whether, I think from my own experience, uh, for some people, if the set is right, if the setting is right, if they have people who are competent to help people with all kinds of difficulties that they might experience through these experiences, if they can be comforting, if they can help them through this, the high, most highly trained people, I think, might be assigned to help people go through this. If those things are together, then I think what we're going to have is something like the Greek mysteries, because that was the role of the Greek mysteries. The Delphic, uh, pardon me, the Orphic Mysteries and the Eleusinian Mysteries serve that purpose. I think we're going to do the same thing through the electronic age in this way. Now, I'll notice I'm not talking about the social implications of drugs. I'm not talking about its legality. I'm not talking about anything like that. I'm only interested in this in respect to its philosophical purposes, to identify the fact that there is a door and the door is pretty close, and for some people they needed to know that. Now, just I'd like to give you a last um, observation in my own life. When I was into this game from 1948 uh, up until uh, 55, and especially 53, 4, 5, three, four, or five. 
I was at the American Academy of Asian Studies and we had a Tibetan Lama there that I studied with, Lama Tata. We had a class that only had four students, one dropped, we only had three students. It was a full Tibetan Lama, tremendously skilled, insightful, philosophically trained. I worked with uh, Ji Ming Shen, a native Taoist. We only had four people in the class. Hari Das Chaudhary was there then teaching, and he only had six or seven students. That is to say, in the whole San Francisco region during this time, Eastern thought along the lines that I've been describing was totally, for the most part, unknown. Then two things happened within a short period of time, what I call the miracle of the two pills. The birth control pill came at the same time as LSD. Within a very short time, that changed the whole culture. Then within a short while, you could give a talk in San Francisco, you could fill the rooms. That's what changed it. And also, the whole idea of men expressing and searching in themselves for some way of loving without pregnancy broke through, and that changed mankind. So I think those two things are the most significant things that took place. Uh, and I think this is going to be the third. This is going to be the third. The highest art, the highest art, the most talented people, the people who could come together to help one another go through experiences like that, to try to therefore take them from this into more formal ways of studying it, such as Buddhism, Hinduism, etc., or Platonic thought, or uh, pseudo Dionysius, whatever system they're in. What should it do? It should awaken it. That's its purpose. Show that it's possible. Make it open to man. And many of the people I've known in the, in, during these days who were Freudians and who thought all mysticism was merely repressed libido, overnight had to change. They had to change their position. It changed overnight. Suddenly now, you could talk about it, it became more available. Uh, the split was still there, but it wasn't in the same numbers. Therefore, it changed the world. It changed San Francisco. The whole intellectual world changed. At that same, same time, of course, um, um, what's, what's um, towards the perception? Uh, um, who? Huxley. Huxley, right, right. Huxley came out with that with peyote. Peyote, therefore, was available in San Francisco at that time for $3.50. You could get a whole box, a shoebox full of peyote buttons. Yeah, it legitimately, there was no law against it. Uh, you could send away to the farmers, not to, you could send away to El, uh, El Paso and get a whole box of them for $3.50. And it was perfectly legal, and people therefore were participating in that at the same time, and that broke through. And that's when people like uh, uh, Gary Schneider and people like that were involved in it. And uh, it changed, it changed everything. And I think, therefore, this is where it's going to go. I think it's going to go here. I think we have the people and the talent. This is where it's going to go. It's going to change things. Thank you. Throw it open. <clears throat> but people are getting, it seems to me, that people are getting more and more into beliefs. The fundamentalists, they say, all you have to do is believe that you're saved and you're saved, and, and people oh. are buying into that. And don't oh, yeah. That. I'm sure. It seems to, they seem to be growing. Oh, sure. But if this works for uh, a small percentage of people, they need it. Yeah, this is only open to a small group of people who want to go through it. Um, I think it's uh, inevitable. I think that's where our culture is going to go. I think it's only going to address the needs of a small number of people. Uh, yes, people are some, on the other side, there are many people going back to fundamentalist beliefs. Yeah, that's all true. That's all true. That's all true. I think this will be our mysteries. Yeah. Yeah. How will it take shape? A theater form or? Uh, it, it may require it may require a whole new a whole new scene. It may take one. I think has to design perhaps a whole new living room, as it were. Or, uh, one has to bring to it all the greatest art objects or, or things of that nature into the environment. 
have to be around things that are beautiful, anything that could enhance it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's where it's going. But it's in the realm of the arts and philosophy. Well. At least that's what I'm getting. Uh, well, you see, uh, the thought might be, well then, all right, people will then be addicted to this. Maybe they'll be attached to it. Okay, that's going to be another problem. Uh, but once, once you see, once it is seen that the mind is what it is that sees, a good number of those people are going to explore philosophy. Inevitably. And if it's presented within that kind of a background, if that comes along with it, because the allegory of the cave in the upper world is Platonic, they're going to have to try to understand what that means, and that's opening up to Plato's Republic. I think on the same way, by the way, I think, the, uh, I think Christians might uh, do the same thing with the Stations of the Cross, or they may use it for that purpose. I think there's going to be a competition between uh, different systems vis-a-vis -vis multimedia and virtual reality. Tibetan Book of the Dead cast in the same way, it's going to be the same thing. But I think what's going to be astonishingly different is that I think this is going to open up for our culture, Plato. Why? Because if you're going to use your mind and you see that this is possible and you can participate more fully, those are the conditions you need to become a Platonist. If that becomes part and parcel of your experience, then there may be a gateway to it through this. I don't know whether I'd be sitting in the first row, though. But I think this will take place. That is to say, I don't think I'll, I'll be part of it, but I think this is where it's going. Yeah. Well, Plato says, everything is one, everything is good. But then you just say it's the idea of good, but it's still an idea. That goes beyond that. Yeah, okay. No. Uh, it's difficult to hold on to, to this curious notion, but when he talks about the idea of the good, it's with a capital I. The difficulty is that that's a Greek word, idea. It's not translated when you use the word idea. An idea is not a thought. It's not a concept. All right? An idea of necessity, all right? Uh, well, there are two ways to deal with it. Let me deal with it the first way. The idea of the good is to, idea is literally to behold. To behold the good. And that's why it takes on the form of the most brilliant light of being. To behold the good, that's not the good, that's beholding the good, and that's the experience of it. Another use of the word idea in Platonic thought is, which makes it totally different from an idea, all right, let's say, uh, if there is such a thing as man, must there not be some cause of man? Now, what marks the Greek, I the, the Greek notion of the idea of man is that this is an archetype. A, all right, that archetype, therefore, is generative. It is what is responsible for the diversity that you find among mankind. Mm -hmm. right? Therefore, it's a generative, it has generative power. It is itself an ideal. Right? All of the variations of potentialities that emerge from man's existence can be traced back to this one ideal. So it's an ideal, it's a pure form, it contains within itself that full range of all the manifestations and potentialities that one discovers in mankind. 
It is both the beginning and end of man, the full range of its potential, the whole destiny of man is tied up in this just one notion, which some people call an archetype. That's the idea of man. So that's not just a concept. The concept is that if you see three things and you can find something similar among them, that that's a concept of it. Right? I still see archetype as a concept. OK. okay. See, so, uh, would you not agree a concept is not generative? If I have the idea of a chair, or a concept of a chair by looking at these, this row of chairs, the I concept I have wasn't the cause of these. No. Ah, archetype it is. I see. Okay. Generative, see, it's the cause of it. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's, the, that's why there's a difference between concept, archetype, or idea. So if you see these chairs, then you'd have an idea. Concept. You had the concept, and you'd be thinking of all the chairs according to they would look like yeah. these. But one would never say with a concept that that's the cause of the many different kinds of chairs there are. Would one? No, but you no, know, that's right. a that's carpenter right. might make a chair that would fit into uh, his idea of a chair. Yeah, okay. How about with man now? now can you move from chairs to man? Well, that's, that's, could be. Why don't you give it a shot? Try it. Question? Question? Yeah. Well, there's a guy once told me that your character is in my dream. I have a dream. told me to sort of try and wake up in the dream and uh, go over to him and uh, tell him what to do. He said, because they're the ones who create my world. Uh, is, he, is he actually implying that those characters in my dream are like archetypes? Yeah, that's what he's saying. Yeah. Have you done that? Well, it's so hard though, because it's hard to um, wake up in my dream. Uh, what do you do to do it? What do I do to do it? Yeah. Um, I just tell myself to do it, that I'm going to do it when I have my dream. That's right. Over and over and over again. Over and over and over again, and you'll do it. Well, actually, this guy, he said, he said, yeah, I've done keep trying. I do it. He says, keep trying, keep trying, because someday you won't have to try, I'll just be. Yeah, I've, I've, yeah. Early in my youth, uh, I had such terrible nightmares that I'd fight going to sleep all night until I'd finally pass out. And one night I said, hey, I'm going to wake up in the middle of one of these things. I, I, there's no way out. And so sure enough, you know, I woke up in the middle of a dream and said, hey, I know that behind that door is that terrible monster. I'm going to go out the other door. <laughs> Yeah, so I woke up in dreams, that gave the experience of the latitude. There's a certain range of freedom you can have in dreams. But he is saying, is he not, if I understand you, that you can also dialogue with the people within the dreams. <coughs> I have found that that's limited. Now he, of course, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, hear more about that, actually, the full range of that. because. You see, the thing, the thing that you want to do in dreams is to trigger, uh, assist, bring about the highest range of human experience possible, rather than manipulating this and that. I think he was coming from his perspective, and sort of like something you were saying last week. He was saying that when I'm awake, I'm walking around, I'm really asleep. But when I'm asleep, and I'm dreaming, I'm really, really awake. Yeah. that's where everything gets created. That's right. You were saying something last, yeah. last week that our big, one of our problems is that we think that we see the, that there's light, we see the light, but mm -hmm. it's, the lights aren't really on, the lights are really off. Yeah, that's right. Yes, that's quite true. Um, the important thing in dreams is to recognize, uh, one, that if you can understand a dream just in terms of its own message, in terms of itself rather than interpreting it, then invariably you come up with the insight that it's telling you something you need to know about life that you've ignored, or you've misunderstood, or you interpreted in one way or the other so as not to be able to see it. What that means then is that there is something awake in your everyday world 
like right now, there's something awake to our entire existence, but our ego allows us only to see a fraction of it through a slit, and the dream wakes us up at night, right, wakes up with a dream, and lets you know what you ignored. Therefore, uh, what we call the dream master, the, the creator of dreams, is extremely profound because it has to be able to reach into your past for the symbols and the images you need in order to communicate what it is you missed. has to put it in such a way so succinctly that you can then quickly understand it when you have the tools to do it. And therefore, it is truly an, a, a masterful creator of dreams. So the... Uh, <clears throat> so, the, so the goal, the whole goal in dream work would be to try to then uh, hold up the activities within a dream while still being in a dream um, and just uh, get to the point where one can allow it to happen. Same thing in meditation, allow it to happen. It's that same kind of uh, witness consciousness, and that opens up larger, more universal experiences. Um, <clears throat> the other way, a much simpler way, is uh, become friendly with your, to your dream master. Toast it, right? Be friendly to it. Know it as a friend. Terribly, very, you know, it's the most profound thing. It's man's doorway into the divine. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a passageway. It's a passageway into participating in the profound. Companion, friend, associate, shares. So, for myself, uh, while this I think is inevitable. What I would like to see in the future of philosophy is how man can then become most closely associated with the dream master. Because I think that's non-electronic, non it doesn't have all of these problems implicit in it. It's a much more natural, creative way. And it turns man to, to recognize that in his mind there's something very profound and higher than his ego it can ever imagine. So. I think we're going to go this way with our technology, but I think the, uh, the more we, the more, and I think this is the age for it, the age is that we're going to become fronting more and more the rational, the intellectually perfect dream master, creatively shaping and molding our, our own days. Um, In other words, we're still going to have to do it naturally. Yeah. Well, I think that I think it's going to be two things are going to be offered. This is going to be virtual reality for many people, but I think the more this becomes an art, dreaming, dream master, dialoguing, sharing, it's going to be in competition one with the other. In what sense are we already at this virtual reality uh, place? Because I'm thinking in terms of the movies that are out now with the special effects, yeah. they're awesome. Yeah. No, it's but just, there isn't a higher purpose to any right. of, uh, right. of, say, water or yeah. all this other business. That's right. But in many ways, I think we're already there. Yeah, that's right. That's where it's going. Yeah. All we have to do is find a way to, to see as multimedia becomes well, more yeah, available, yeah, yeah. Yeah. the more people can do it in smaller units within, without terribly expensive equipment the more it's going to shape this kind of purpose, I believe. But as I say, I, d I don't know whether I think I might take an interest in it, but I don't know whether I'd really say I'd center my activities in it. That's not where I'm at. I think the rational, the intellectual way through dreams and meditation is the obvious way, and the more profound way, more direct way. But I think that's where our culture is headed. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, I think that's quite possible. And I think they're going to do it with the, all kinds of catalysts from the drug world. 
The assumption of the drug world or biochemistry is that for every, every dis, uh, experience, every distinguished experience, if this is the range of human experience and if it can be cataloged <clears throat> as states of mind, then there should be a drug, a biochemical correlate to every experience. And therefore, if that's the case, I think that what they're going to work it out, just like Mendeleev periodic table of elements, someone's going to have a periodic table of elements of psychic states of mind, and I think they're going to find correlates to it that are biochemically based, the synthetically produced chemicals that will fill it out. And among these, I think there might be some that would fit right into this. I don't know enough about it at this point. Uh, and I think that's where we're going. Pardon? The analogy of the cave. Uh, yeah. Did you sort of like translate a dream interpretation to the, the cave experience? Or? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I follow. Could you do it again? I'm not sure I understand what I'm asking. Uh, oh, well, fish. Uh, well, the, the cave people there are sort of like chained to the wall and they've got some sort of a image of what they think the truth is. However, if they oh. come unbounded, okay. 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 I'll see if I can fill it in. Okay. All right. Let us assume then we, we now have some candidates for our multimedia virtual reality show. Right. That means they have already been screened and tested in such a way that their most basic beliefs can be identified. These are their beliefs. All right. We can identify the basic beliefs that block their own spiritual progress. These are the kind of beliefs I'm talking about. They are beliefs about themselves, depreciatory views of themselves, a, a insufficient view of the nature of reality, and correspondingly, a view of, of the world, their everyday world, that diminishes its value. If we could find not only these beliefs, but find from each, from analysis, where they came from, how these people were influenced, because what's interesting about a belief is no one picks up a belief in general and always picks up a belief from a particular circumstance. So that if you could then identify these beliefs the subject has and get some insight into how they came to those conclusions, that's not enough, by the way, for them to get rid of it. All right. then. Wouldn't it be interesting, let us say this is their uncle, who when they were very open and susceptible and, and uh, um, most receptive, the uncle then introduced and persuaded them of the truth of one of these beliefs. Therefore, when we have the virtual reality show, we'll have the uncle walking back and forth from photographs, all right? And the object on the head, whatever it's going to be, is going to be the caricature of that belief, which is then going to be thrown, therefore, on the screen. It's going to be, they're going to see their belief in caricature. All of their primary beliefs, all of their false beliefs about the nature of themselves that is false, about ultimate reality, and about the, the world about us. Then, uh, according to the story, then, they take this to be real, they would then be allowed to, to stay in it and to see it, experience it, and they would be experienced to a great extent their, their world as they believe it to be. Then someone then has to come down into the cave and free them of their fetters, force them to stand, and look at the source of those ideas, the uncle. So they have to now give an account of what was it about it that made those ideas believable to them they have to now address the most difficult question of all, which is, how were those beliefs made so believable that the subject believed them? Therefore, by questioning through this, this process, all right, so that they can then see the effect of those beliefs on the wall of the cave, on the fact that they're produced by these people that they believed, and the fire behind, which is casts the flames, is sincerity. They appeared so believable because they appeared so sincere, so beautiful, so knowing, 
and they have to see that's really what causes them to believe the beliefs. They're going to go through quite a few shocks as they see each one of these beliefs characterized in this way. And therefore, they must now be led to train their mind in a new way. That's up the steep ascent. That means now, we are now going to have to introduce them to the, the arts, what Plato calls the arts, or the ways of understanding, which is uh, the spiritual way of understanding music, uh, music, gymnastics, arithmetic, geometry, solid geometry, harmonics, astronomy, and dialectic. So that would have to be now built into the show. Now each one of these things I just mentioned has two ways, there are two ways of understanding each one of them, a spiritual way and a popular way, as he points out, and he's always taking the higher. All right. Therefore, these people and the subjects now are going to have to be then flashed, the reality of these things are going to have to be flashed through them through this virtual reality. As an example, music in Plato is the uh, ability to be able to judge different states of mind that people have. Why? Why is that important? See, because previously they believed someone who didn't know the truth, but appeared to, as if they did know the truth. They appeared as a knower when they really didn't know the reality. They appeared to be sincere, but they weren't really sincere. Therefore, one of the problems is they lack the ability to judge different states of mind. So part of this training now is going to be, quickly through virtual reality, how to spot people who are to various degrees phonies to various degrees of sincerity. So that would be music. All right. uh, arithmetic uh, uh, to deal with the philosophical question of what after all is the nature of the one. So each one of the studies in Plato would have to have its corresponding experience in the virtual world of reality. And uh, therefore when they reach the upper world at night they then have to experience what it's like in the upper world at night and then in the day so they see the true, true sun in its own place, the most brilliant light of being. Uh, each one of these things can be in principle be worked out. No reason why it can't be done. Is, is the true world at night a dream? The true, when he gets up in the, say the difficulty is that uh, the person has to be prepared for the experience. Therefore, they then have to see these realities in reflected surfaces when they're in the upper world, which is similar to the very structure in the cave. Only here they believe it to be true. Here they have to be taught that these things do reflect an ultimate reality. So this is a training so that they get the first glimpse of what they are then going to experience most directly. So therefore we'd have to have a very beautiful shiny lake where the very, ob the very images of the things we want to persuade them of, of being higher and a greater reality would have to be shown in it. They would have to have all the aesthetic qualities. So then the reality of those then can be presented in a much richer way. Um, Thank you. That's yeah, 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 yeah. Do more. Um, when you mentioned the music, would help people discern what kind of characters people have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, you'd need some really good music, wouldn't you? Yeah. Behind all of this? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, it would be a kind of Disneyland of the mind, instead of for entertainment. And I think that's where, our, that's where I see our youth going, that's where I see people going, into multimedia and ultimate, you know, virtual reality. Sure, they can make up all kinds of games, how to talk to your parents, yeah. sitting around and discussing the How issues. to talk to the uncle, how to talk to the parent, how to talk to the sister, how, whatever it is that convince them of whatever it was those beliefs were. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. I just, uh, <coughs> just uh, for uh, the Saturdays, like Net Day 96, uh, it's for all the high schools where people are trying to hook the high schools up to the internet. Mm -hmm. I'm working with this one school group and they hooked up about 50 computers in classrooms and they've got them all tied into a server and various teachers, math, mm -hmm. science, and biology, where they're at right now is they're, they're working on the staircase. Mm -hmm. They're trying to create mm -hmm. CD-ROM various uh, yeah. educational aids. Yeah. I don't, they haven't yet plugged into the, the, the psychological side of it. Yeah, that's right. But that problem will come. That has to come. 
spell. Oh. And there are a lot of things you could include in it, like you could be able to test people with a variety of measures and, uh, and uh, physiological measures and GST, you know, galvanic skin responses and all kinds of things. You could have all kinds of readings that parallel it. Yeah. Probably have on a CD run, so yeah. probably, probably regress people back to their significant moments. That's right. That's right. That's right. This could also be used as a form of thought control, too. Every technology brings about two things a good <laughs> and it's negative. That's right. That's right. That's why this is whatever you do here, there's always going to be a negative side to it. That's right. Now, you're going to find more and more people through this are going to appear as if they know. Yeah. So therefore, you'll generate more sophists than you ever had before. Oh, yeah. But not this way. Yeah. <laughs> See, Plato, the only place in, in uh, Plato's writings where he talks about a way to get knowledge uh, of oneself, both in the present, past, and future, is in the Republic where he says the only way you can do it is through dreams. So that's a, that's a system where the mind is, is using part of, it, part of its higher self to bring about the kind of meaningful changes that are more important for its own psychic growth. Mm -hmm. It's very artificial. I just find it unsettling. Hmm? It's Pardon? an intermediate business. Uh, I, find, I find it unsettling. Well, um, you put in your glasses or whatever it is you have to do in everything happens external to you. That's... You're absolutely right. Yeah. Plus, I'm... Yeah, that's right. Anyway. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's artificial. No matter how sophisticated it is, it's still artificial. Oh, yeah. That's right. And you take off the glasses or whatever it is that you do in order to induce it, uh, it's gone. That's yeah. right. That's right. Drug. Yeah. It's a drug. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I can see where you said that our society is in that direction because it's, it fits right in with the mm -hmm. trend. Anyway, just take a pill and you're in heaven or whatever, or yeah. pain it goes yeah. away. Yeah. See, yeah. the, the uh, in terms of philosophy, away, see, <laughs> yeah, in, in terms of philosophy, if there were this pill that could do away with man's problems, of a certain range, let us say. All right. uh, what this kind of philosophy does, it uses people's problems so that they then have to come to reach and develop their mind. It uses man's problems for its own psychic development. And therefore, if there was some way in which man could eliminate his problems, philosophy would still be looking for a way to develop the mind for that same purpose. It would just lose an important way of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> because many people get into the game of using their mind because they don't like where they're at and they don't like what they're experiencing and therefore they see the advantage of training the mind for its own sake after a while. Yeah. So if there is the magic pill, right, we'll have to look for some other way to train the mind. And we'd lose something valuable. Well, because so I know quite a few people only get into philosophies to the point where they can resolve their own personal problems and they leave it. And that's enough for them. They don't go beyond that. Well, that's, that's only natural. No, no. But it's probably easier to get enlightenment experience than it is to resolve your personal problems. Because many people Many Roshis and Yogis, etc., have all kinds of personal problems, yet they're presumably enlightened. No, that's only natural. Because an enlightenment experience can be a breakthrough that leaves the structure still in place. And therefore, to whatever degree it's still in place, it's going to have its manifestation in a variety of ways, whether you like it or not. Yeah, there's a Roshi that will remain name, nameless, but he still had an alcohol problem even after the so-called enlightenment. Oh, yeah. People were still to alcohol and he never, I 
far as I know, I never cured him. So yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there's a long mm -hmm. list of, of uh, Roshis that we know, and Yogis that we know that yeah. that have very clearly still have their problem, even though they're advanced in some spiritual sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. It seems to me they would be free of that. No, 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 because, <coughs> so, uh, put it in another way, enlightenment in terms of uh, uh, Tibetan thought, Hindu thought, Buddhist thought, take Buddhist, it's easier. The ox herding pictures. Yeah. Ox herding pictures means that they are eight stages of enlightenment experiences. Yeah. And therefore, you, know, you can have all kinds of interesting enlightenment experiences that yeah. still do not directly impact the basic problems the person may have. Yeah. And the number of people that are up here in the tenth are very, very few historically, like Basui. Yeah. Basui. Uh, is one of the great ones. Right? His enlightenment was of such a nature that it uh, destroyed, burned up, however you want to describe it, all his personal beliefs. And he goes down in history as one of the rarest of these people. And uh, his story can be found in Three Pillars of Zen, beautiful story. Yeah. So it's in the Zen bones, I think, he has some of those little... Yeah. 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 Flesh Zen bones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for letting me take you through this thank you. fun trip.